Hey everyone, I'm Monica and I'm an internal medicine attending and my goal is to help you succeed in medicine whether you're a medical student or a resident. So in my previous video we talked about the causes of hyperkalemia, so today we're going to focus on the treatments of hyperkalemia. And just as a quick reminder, I do like to go into the physiology of things because I think it's super fun and I really want you to understand why we give the treatments that we do. So if you're just here for a quick review, feel free to jump around to sections using the timestamps or just skip ahead to the really quick summary at the end. So now let's get started. In internal medicine, you'll see that we love our algorithms and our categories. So for the treatment of hyperkalemia, there are two big categories plus calcium. So the two big categories, what are they? Well, in the body, if you're raising the level of potassium in the blood, the body's gonna wanna do a couple of things to bring that potassium level down. So one is it's gonna wanna shift the potassium from the blood into the cells, and then two, it's gonna wanna ramp up excretion of potassium from the kidneys. So when we're treating hyperkalemia, we're basically just promoting what the body would normally do to try to lower that potassium. So what are the two categories of treatments? The first one is called temporizing treatments. So these are treatments that promote shifting of potassium from the blood into the cells. And it's called temporizing because you might figure out that when you're shifting potassium just from the blood into the cells, you're just moving it from compartment to compartment within the body. You're not actually getting rid of it from the body. So that is the second category of treatments, what I like to call eliminating treatments. Treatments that promote excretion of potassium through the kidneys so that you're actually getting rid of potassium from the body. So let's start with the first category, temporizing treatments. So if you watch my video on the causes of hyperkalemia, hopefully these causes will sound familiar. So factors that cause hyperkalemia by shifting potassium from inside the cell to outside the cell include insulin deficiency, beta blockers, and metabolic acidosis. So there are other causes, but we're gonna just focus on these three because these are the ones that we actually focus on when we're treating hyperkalemia. So if you have a patient with hyperkalemia, you're gonna to wanna to do the opposite of these things, right? Because you wanna shift potassium from in the blood back inside the cells. So if you know the causes of hyperkalemia, you can then figure out the treatments for hyperkalemia, which are then gonna be the causes of hypokalemia. So let's start with the first one, insulin. Since insulin deficiency shifts potassium out of cells, giving insulin should move potassium into cells. So yay, insulin is a treatment for hyperkalemia. Now one thing I forgot to learn before I started my clinical rotations is how do you actually give the treatment? Like when you get on the wards, you're gonna wanna treat a pa the patient with insulin, but then you actually have to sit down at the computer and know what dosage form, what dose, and so all the specifics. But don't worry, I got you. I have a document in the description box with all the doses and dosage forms of the medications I'm mentioning in this video today. So the one I'm gonna actually talk about in detail is gonna be insulin, because you actually do get tested on the dosage form and potentially even the dose of insulin that you wanna give if you're treating hyperkalemia. So let's start with dosage form. Dosage form is how you actually give the medication to the patient. So insulin can be given subcutaneously or intravenously. You might be more familiar with the subcutaneous form because you'll see patients with diabetes injecting themselves subcutaneously. But when you're treating hyperkalemia, you're actually giving it intravenously. So remember that, you're giving insulin IV when you're treating hyperkalemia. And there are many types of insulin. So there's short-acting insulin, there's long-acting insulin, but the only one that you can give IV is actually regular insulin. So to treat hyperkalemia, you're giving IV regular insulin. Remember that because I think there's actually even a URL question specifically on that point. So the starting dose is typically 10 units and you can actually repeat this multiple times depending on how severe the hyperkalemia is. Now, this is important. What complication could you potentially cause when you give insulin? Well, what else does insulin lower? Glucose. So you could potentially cause hypoglycemia, which we all know can be life-threatening. So when you give insulin, you wanna give dextrose at the same time. And it's usually in the form of D50 or 50% dextrose. So remember that the D50 that's being given with the insulin is not actually treating the hyperkalemia itself. It's just preventing hypoglycemia from the insulin. So caveat here, if the patient's glucose is already greater than 250, then you actually skip the dextrose, just give the insulin for obvious reasons. So next, since blocking beta-adrenergic activity is gonna shift potassium out of cells, 
then stimulating beta adrenergic activity is gonna do the opposite. It's gonna move potassium into cells, which is what we want. So how can we stimulate beta adrenergic activity? We can do that with the beta agonist. So you might first think like, okay, what about epinephrine? But epinephrine is obviously gonna cause a whole different set of problems, so we do not use that to treat hyperkalemia. Instead, we actually use albuterol, which is also a beta agonist, and we use a higher dose of albuterol than we would for what we usually use it to treat, which is bronch for bronchodilation in patients with asthma or COPD. And we give it as a nebulizer, meaning the patient is gonna breathe it in through a mask. And remember that one thing you do have to watch out for when it comes to giving a beta agonist is tachycardia. So if you have a patient who has already tachycardia, you want to be careful with this medication or avoid it altogether. And finally, we're left with metabolic acidosis. So in metabolic acidosis, that tends to lower the pH and you have all these hydrogen ions floating around. So the cells are going to buffer that by taking up hydrogen ions. But in exchange, they have to give up a cation because they want to maintain electron neutrality and that tends to be potassium. So we can reverse this whole process by giving IV sodium bicarbonate, which is a base. So that is going to increase the pH and again, reverse that whole process so that the cells actually want to put out hydrogen ions and take up potassium ions instead. So there's a big caveat to sodium bicarbonate. Theoretically, it should work, but small studies have shown that it doesn't have that much of an effect. So we don't usually use it until it's like the last resort. So you have a patient with severe hyperkalemia and you just wanna throw the kitchen sink at them and give whatever you can to bring that potassium down. So there we have our three temporizing treatments. IV insulin plus T50, albuterol nebulizer, and IV sodium bicarbonate. So remember that these temporizing treatments are just moving potassium from the blood into the cells. So the effect actually comes on pretty quickly, within 30 to 60 minutes. And it lowers the potassium level on average about 0.5 to 1.5 milliequivalents per liter. And then once the effect comes on, it actually can last for several hours. But if you have someone with severe hyperkalemia, you're gonna wanna give multiple doses. You might be thinking, wait, so if we give these treatments and the effect only lasts a matter of hours, isn't the patient gonna just get hyperkalemic again? Yes, that's totally true, which is why we have the second category of treatments. So moving on to our second category, which is the category of eliminating treatments or treatments that actually get rid of potassium from the body. So remember that the two ways we get rid of potassium are one through the urine and two through the feces. So there we have our two targets. So one, the urine. How can we get patients to urinate more to get rid of potassium? Well, what medication class do we use to get patients to urinate more? Yes, diuretics. So loop and thiazide diuretics work to increase potassium secretion by decreasing sodium delivery to the distal parts of the nephron. If you don't know the mechanism for this, I highly recommend that you check out my video on potassium regulation. On to our next target, which is poop. So we do lose a small amount of potassium through our feces, so we can promote that by giving a medication called a GI or gastrointestinal cation exchanger. So what are these exactly? They're oral medications that are non-absorbable, so they stay in the gut. And what they do is they bind potassium that's in the gut so that it's not absorbed into the body. And what they do is, so they're called cation exchangers because the medications have cations on them that are exchanged for potassium in the gut. So the three medications that you'll see are one, sodium polystyrene sulfonate, or KXLate for, is the brand name, sodium zirconium cyclosilicate, which is localma, and pteromer. So KXLA is actually falling out of favor these days because there's this scary side effect of intestinal necrosis. So we are kind of leaning more towards using the newer ones that have a lower risk of that. So that's gonna be your localma and your pteromer. So KXLate exchanges sodium for potassium in the gut, pteromer exchanges calcium, and localma exchanges sodium and hydrogen ions. Okay, so now we've gone through our two options of diuretics and GI cation exchangers. But there are caveats to these, right? So for diuretics to work, the patient actually has to be able to urinate. So they need to have at least moderately decreased kidney function. So normal to maybe moderately decreased, but basically the point is that they need to be able to make urine, otherwise you're giving diuretics and you're just wasting time. Also, for GI cation exchangers, the patient has to actually poop to get rid of the potassium. And sometimes it can take hours for the patient to have a bowel movement if they have one at all. So let's say you get a patient who has 
very severely decreased kidney function and super high potassium level, and you don't have time to sit there and wait for them to have a bowel movement. So how else can we get rid of potassium? So remember I said there are three potential options for treatment. So the third option is hemodialysis, or basically fake kidneys. So the patient's blood is gonna be run through a dialysis machine. The potassium is gonna diffuse from the patient's blood to the dialysate, which is a special solution that's in the dialysis machine. And then the blood is gonna be returned to the patient. So there we have our three options for how we can get rid of potassium from the body. And that's gonna be diuretics, GI cation exchangers, and hemodialysis. So remember I said that there's a third sort of category of treatments for hyperkalemia. And that third one is calcium. I don't like to group it with the other two categories because I want you to remember that it doesn't actually do anything to lower the potassium level. The purpose of giving calcium in the treatment of hyperkalemia is to lower the risk of cardiac arrhythmias. So early in the video, I mentioned that hyperkalemia destabilizes cardiac membranes by decreasing membrane excitability. So again, it makes it harder for cells to depolarize. So essentially it slows things down. So then you're gonna promote things like blocks, conduction blocks. So that includes sinus arrest, AV blocks, bundle branch blocks, all kinds of blocks. And if conduction is moving more slowly, you open up the opportunity for tachyarrhythmias as well. So you can get ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. If you're early on in medical school and these terms sound like Greek to you, that's totally fine. Just know that calcium is given to prevent life-threatening arrhythmias. So let's do a quick recap of what we just talked about. There are three big categories of treatments for hyperkalemia. There are the temporizing treatments that shift potassium intracellularly. There are eliminating treatments that actually get rid of potassium from the body. And then there's calcium that stabilizes cardiac membranes and lowers the risk of arrhythmias. So the temporizing treatments or the treatments that shift potassium intracellularly are gonna include insulin plus D50, beta agonists such as albuterol and IV sodium bicarbonate. And then the second category, which are the eliminating treatments are gonna include diuretics, GI cation exchangers, and hemodialysis. So that's it guys. If you wanna know how to apply this in a step-by-step -step algorithm, check out my next video where I really walk you through step-by-step. -step. This is gonna be more applicable to those going on to clinical rotations. So if you are about to start your third year clinical rotations, I highly recommend watching that video. Thanks again for watching. And as always, I welcome feedback and suggestions in the comments. If you like the content, please hit the like button and subscribe for more tips on how to succeed in your medical career. See you next time.